Hey everybody, welcome back to Walden Community Church. My name is David, and uh, we're gonna start a brand new series this morning. And I wanted to briefly look at the beginning of John's Gospel because he starts with two very interesting encounters. And in them, we see the same phrase being used. John 1 verse 35, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. If you skip down the page to verse 43, it says the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. This Easter, we're going to begin a 10-week journey all through Jesus' ministry, discovering who he is, and asking all sorts of questions. But ultimately, I hope it's a passage of you being taken to come and see Jesus. I know, I know, what could possibly be exciting or new about a study on Jesus? Haven't we exhausted all the stories? Haven't we asked all the questions? What more could possibly be said? Well, this year, I didn't want Easter to just sneak up on us. We always prepare for Christmas. We always give it time. You, you rev up for Christmas, but Easter just kind of lands like a ton of bricks and vanishes. This year, I thought, you know, let's prepare ourselves for the cross. Let's anticipate the empty tomb. Let's make a big deal out of Easter. In John chapter 1, we see the disciples. They are hungry to learn, eager to be with Jesus. And in both stories, they are told, come and see. I pray that this year we can be led to a new place. And, and hopefully, you'll take me by the hand and allow yourself to be taken to a real and authentic Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. Last week, we looked at Jesus' preparation for ministry. We read about his temptation in the desert with the devil. And today, we're going to be in John chapter 4. We have a beautiful interaction between Jesus and the woman at the well. Verse 4, Jesus had gone through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In this first story, we see Jesus is speaking to a woman, and she's not Jewish. But it's not just that she's Gentile. What is even more unique is that she's Samaritan, and she's a woman. Why is that important? Well, because Jesus is in the region of Samaria, in the town of Sychar. And this is not a place that you just end up in. Sychar and Samaria were avoided by the Jews at all costs. Jews would cross the Jordan River and walk past this area only to cross back over once Samaria had been passed. So for Jesus and his disciples to be here, that's intentional. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, 
who gave us this well and drunk from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus asks for a drink of water, and the woman points out, you have no cup, which means what? Well, it means Jesus would have to use her cup. Back in the 1930s, it was not uncommon to see segregation at a drinking fountain. Blacks and whites were not allowed to use the same cup for drinking. And I think that's a perfect example that we're seeing here between the Jews and the Samaritans. Bottom line, it's classism, it's racism. Samaritans were a lower class, they were a lower status, they were dirty, they were untouchable. The Pharisees would even pray a prayer and they would thank God that God didn't make them a Samaritan. But that's how Jesus operates. He doesn't always do what we would expect. And we often see him crossing lines, especially lines that society says perhaps are normal. Sharing a cup with someone is an intimate act. It brings that person into your world. The early church used to practice drinking communion from the same cup. And that idea was that the church was unified. When a man and a woman get married, one ritual is to drink from the same cup. Again, it's a sign of the two becoming one. So for a Jewish rabbi to drink from the same cup as a Samaritan woman would have been totally unheard of. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come and draw here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now, when you read this interaction, and you're listening to the voices, just, you know, be honest. Let me, let me ask, does this sound nice? Does this sound, I mean, from Jesus, does this sound like a nice thing to say? When you read this story, do you ever think, wow, Jesus is being a little harsh with her. Jesus is a little direct with her, right? A little matter of fact. She says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right, and technically, You've had five husbands. <laughs> Wouldn't a statement like that be a little embarrassing? Maybe bring you some shame? I thought Jesus was supposed to be loving. It feels like Jesus is singling her out. It feels like he's shaming her. I mean, a second ago, he's asking for her help. He wants a drink of water, and now he's bringing up her sordid past. Is that what's happening? Of course not. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus taught, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, we think, and we even preach sometimes, that maybe Jesus wants us to be happy or that Jesus is nice and forgiving and he probably turns a blind eye to our sin. But that's not who Jesus is. If I were to grab your hand and say, come on, come and see Jesus, I would not lead you to a man who turned a blind eye to sin. I would not lead you to a man who wasn't direct with people about their issues. Listen, would you want your doctor to sugarcoat a life-threatening illness if you had one? Would you want your kid's teacher to soften the truth if your child was failing school? Why then would you want your savior to pull punches with you? Jesus isn't interested in my happiness. He is interested in my holiness. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus wants to give me life and he wants to give me life to the full. But in order for that to happen, in order for us to claim that abundant life, I need to relinquish the hold that darkness has on me. How can I claim an abundant life if I'm still living in the dark? How can I be free 
if I am still bound in chains? Jesus isn't trying to be mean with this woman. He is not trying to be harsh. He's being honest. And for her to live the abundant life, Jesus needs to shine the light on the thing that is bringing her down. Jesus isn't trying to be mean to this woman. You know, we said earlier that Jesus was uh, here for a reason, it seems, because he had literally gone out of his way to be here at this place, a place that Jews typically avoided. Well, maybe he goes out of his way just to meet her. Jesus and his disciples could have taken any route, but they didn't. Jesus made a special trip just to talk to her. Why? I mean, she has three strikes against her. She's a foreigner, she's a woman, she's living in sin. Doesn't matter. Jesus loves her and he knows that she's coming. So he sits down at her well, knowing that she is on the way. He shows up ahead of her, aligning her circumstances so that she has an encounter with the living God. That's not shame. That's love. Jesus isn't there to shame her because she already feels shame. After all, she's going to draw water now in the hottest part of the day. Anyone else would go when it was cool, but she goes during this hot hour knowing that, hoping that she'll be alone. Nobody will see her. Nobody will talk to her. She's purposefully trying to avoid confrontation. And Jesus puts himself in her path. He asks for water. And he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, go call your husband and come back. Now, why does Jesus say to go and get your husband? Is it to shame her? No, it's to force her to come face to face with what is keeping her from living that abundant and free life. Jesus says, I have living water. And she says, I would like some of that. And Jesus says, I'd like to give it to you, but something is keeping it from you. Jesus isn't shaming her. He wants her to be perfect. He wants her to be free. He wants her to have the abundant life. But first, she needs to come to grips with her darkness. So Jesus shines a light on it. Even in this next sentence, we're going to see the woman get a little uncomfortable. She'll change the subject and Jesus lets her. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The two of them are talking about worship. And notice, never does Jesus say, well, you know what, this, this conversation is really, it's, it's pointless because, I mean, you're not Jewish, you're not a man, uh, you don't measure up. Instead, Jesus keeps the pace with her. They engage each other in conversation. How awesome is this? <laughs> she gets to have a theological discussion. She gets to have answers from God himself. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just those two sentences, those two sentences, what a huge revelation. Jesus rarely went around telling people that he was the Messiah. In fact, in all of scripture, it only happens three times with Peter at Jesus's trial and right here alone 
with a Samaritan woman over a cup of water. In fact, of the three moments, she is the first. Did you know that? She is the first person he tells. And what does she do? She becomes Jesus' first witness. Jesus' first missionary. Verse 28 says, Then leaving the water jar, the woman went back into town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. See, we, we sometimes describe Jesus as being loving. But when we do that, we equate the word loving to some sort of human version of love. Love can be described as tenderness, as compassion, as sensitivity to the needs of another person. And here at the, with the woman at the well, Jesus is direct, he's honest, he's forthright, he almost seems off-putting. But Jesus says, as the Father has loved you, so have I loved you, abide in my love. God is love, Jesus is love, so everything Jesus does is an act of love. See, it's not enough to just describe Jesus as loving or, or to say that he is loving because he is also holy and he demands holiness from us. Jesus saw potential in this woman. When she desired to be hidden from the world, when she was content to go through life unnoticed, Jesus was on a mission to shine a light on her life in an incredible way. She felt unloved, she felt without worth, and Jesus knew that it was her relationships that continued to drive that message deeper and deeper into her. The men in her life were not helping. They were hurting. She turned to men because she was always told that a man could fix her, that a man could complete her, but it never worked. Each next man promised to be the right one, and they never were. So instead of feeling love, instead of feeling worth, instead of feeling valuable with each passing relationship, she just felt more devalued and more worthless. That is until Jesus sat down with her at a well. Jesus made her feel valued. Jesus made her feel loved because he pursued her just like he pursues you and me. Hiding away is not freedom. Hiding is easy, but it doesn't make us better. We can't hide from darkness. No, we hide in darkness. Jesus loves you too much to leave you there. Jesus values you too much to allow you to stay in your sin. He sees something in you, sees potential in you, and he goes out of his way to liberate you. Look at verse 28. What does it say happens next? It says, then leaving her water jar. That's what she had to do. That's what we have to do. Drop our heavy burden. Abandon the lies that we tell ourselves. Leave behind our old way of life. You see, she didn't have a life before. She didn't have a reason before. No, this woman needed an encounter with the living God. She needed to have her sin exposed in a holy way and a loving way. See, things happen to us I think sometimes God is direct with us. Sometimes God brings our sin out into the light or he shines a light on the things of our old life. And we say, why me, God? Why is this happening to me? Jesus, I thought you were loving. But see, Jesus is loving and he is holy. And oftentimes those sins in our life become exposed because we are ignoring them. We hide them away on purpose. We're covering it up, hoping nobody sees. But Jesus loves us enough to show us that if we're hiding in our sin, then we're not dealing with it. And that hurts us. And it hurts our relationship with him. And so lovingly, he goes out of his way to restore us. I remember being young, walking around, a college campus, trying to deal with a larger-than-life guilt. 
my self-esteem shattered, my joy gone, my ability to get over myself and move on didn't seem possible. I was depressed and I was wondering where my life would go. I had my own come to the well moment. God exposed the darkness in my life and it hurt. But as low as those moments took me, it was also in those moments where God says, I know you're not perfect, but I love you. God says, there's nothing that you can do to make me love you more. There's nothing you will ever do that will make me love you less. This unhealthy guilt that you feel that really is just the guilt of being human, right? That doesn't come from God. Your past does not define you. It's time you left your burden at the well. It's time you started living. It's time you claimed the freedom, that abundant life that God wants to give you. Jesus promises in Matthew 11, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Unhealthy guilt and sin holds us in bondage. But God's grace sets us free and it brings us to who we were created to be. The woman at the well needed to be the hero of a new story. She needed a new thing to live for. She needed a new purpose. She needed a new man, a perfect man. So now she runs back to town. She begins to speak to the people. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She doesn't say, wow, pff, you should see this guy. I met at the well. What a piece of work. He tried to get some water for me and then he insulted me. No. She says, there's a man out there that I've never met before, but he knows me. In fact, he saw right through the walls that I put up and he called me out on my junk and he challenged me to be better. What do you think? Do you think this could be the Messiah? Second Corinthians five says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A brand new change had already begun in her. And from this moment, she would never be the same. She will probably never look at that well quite the same ever again. Jesus shined a light on her old life. He exposed it for what it was. And then she happily chose a brand new path. And so as we begin our own path towards Easter, I would challenge you to ask yourself, do I have access to living water? And yet I continue to keep coming back to the same old well hoping to find something different? Am I trudging through life, hoping that nobody notices? Has God given me gifts and talents and I'm just hiding them away because someone told me I wasn't good enough? Have I not allowed my old life to fully pass away? Do we keep turning to the things of this world to find our meaning, to find our purpose? Or maybe the chains of shame you know, those old labels, they're still attached to you. Jesus says, you're his, but you don't believe it. And so you continue to look at yourself in a broken mirror. The reason why this woman leaves her pot at the well and she runs back to town was because she stopped listening to the world and who the world said that she was. And she began to believe that she was a new creation in Christ. And you, when Paul says in Corinthians that we are a new creation in Christ, the two Greek words for new and creation are kina katis. They literally mean something that has never existed before. Think about that. In Christ, we become something that has never existed before. Only God can do that. 
Only God can make something and speak new words into it and create something that's never been. And that's what he does for us. He makes us new in a holy and loving way. Join me in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful for the cross and for your resurrected son, that he came to this world and he died to forgive us so that we could be free. And right now we're 10 weeks away from Easter, 10 weeks away from pastel clothes and children running around collecting plastic eggs. But before any of that gets here, Lord, we want to take this time to prepare ourselves. And so we look to your son and we ask hard questions. Am I still drawing water from an ancient well? Am I still looking for life in something that I know is dead? In something that I know won't satisfy? Am I listening to the voices of this world that speak to me and define me and tell me who I am and what I'm capable of and what my limitations are? Ten weeks away from Easter, Lord, I want to listen to you. I want your voice to define me. You are my father. You know me better than anyone. And so as I stand before you as your son or your daughter, I ask you to speak new words of new life into me. Give me a new purpose, a new goal. Help me to step into my life as a new creation. I want to be everything that you made me to be. And I want to love you to the end of my days. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his love and his holiness. Thank you that he is direct with me, that he sees the diamond inside the coal, and he does the work to free me. May I do my share of the work. May I self-examine and ask myself those same tough questions. I'm tired of trudging the same path with the same stone pot, going to the same well, drawing the same water. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, but renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for watching. Of course, you're watching us on YouTube or listening to us on our podcast. Of course, this is a link. You can always find that URL, clip it, put it on your own social media page so that other people can see what you saw or heard on Sunday, or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think it might encourage them. Like this video, subscribe to this channel. I see you guys next time. Thanks. Bye.